Hey, this is Julian McClurkin, your chief storyteller with Tried This. But today, we're not telling stories, we're learning lessons. This is a masterclass on how to build wealth. I sit down with Jim Pfeiffer, the founder of Left Field Investors, to learn all about passive investing through real estate. Let's go. So we're getting ready for this masterclass and we're gonna start off with the first chapter. Chapter one is passive investing. And Jim, let's just start there. What is passive investing? Traditionally, passive investing is investing that doesn't require much from the investor. Mm -hmm. So you're not doing anything. You're just putting your money somewhere and someone else runs the operation for you. We're here to talk about investing in real estate specifically. So how is that done passively? In real estate, you basically are sending money to the operator and they, are doing all the work and the investor has no operational duties. So you send them the money and they do the investment. Now there's significant work up front that you have to do to prepare the investment, to vet the operator, make sure you're in the right markets and all that. And we'll talk about that later. But the basics are that passive investing in real estate, you basically wire your money and then you have nothing else to do. Got it. When I hear you say the word operator in my mind, I have like the conductor of a train. And is that kind of similar to what an operator actually is? Yeah, and we'll talk about that in, in later chapters, but the operator, the syndicator, the general partner, GP, all of those are the same terms, synonyms for the person who is operating or taking care of your investment property for you while you sit back and just watch the cash roll in. All right, well, let's talk about some of these investments now. Uh, can you give me some examples of passive investments within the real estate realm? Yeah, so the main thing we're focusing on in this uh, masterclass is private placement offerings. And we'll talk a lot about those. Those are the syndications, private placement offerings. Those are the same thing. But there's a lot of other things in um, real estate that you can do that are passive as well. Private lending to house flippers, um, mortgage notes, crowdfunding websites, tax liens. All of those are also fairly passive. And then one of the most popular ones is investing in single family rentals. Now that sounds passive, but you end up managing your property manager and it becomes it's less passive than than you think when you're jumping in on it what is the most passive real estate investment you could have and then what would be like on the opposite realm what's the most active real estate investment you could have so the most passive are these syndications we're going to talk about that's where you you wire someone money and then they operate it and every month they send you a check and after five years or so, they send you your capital back, plus hopefully some appreciation. Mailbox money. Mailbox money, mm -hmm. exactly. You don't have to do anything. The most active would be the opposite of that, where you're maybe a house flipper, so you have to go find the property, buy it, fix it up, or you're buying a property to rent to somebody else, and so you're dealing with you know, the termites, tenants, and toilets is what people try <laughs> to um, avoid, right? But that's kind of what the um, management process is. So a lot of people have growth from... Most people in real estate, they start at the house flipping or I want to buy a rental property and they start with the active stuff and then as they grow and learn they find passive and so it's kind of like a migration and what we try to do at Left Field Investors and Tribevest helps a lot with this is maybe skip that active part and just go to passive right do your job do your W-2 job whatever you do and then on the side you can do some passive income investing which helps you build your wealth. You know the the real estate market uh, especially right now a lot of people are predicting that we might have a correction coming. And um, you know, because of that, they're sensing some volatility within it. Um, but there's volatility in, stock market as well, in the stock market as well. Um, let's talk about a little bit why it would be better. I know you mentioned index funds. Why would it be better to invest in real estate rather than like index funds, which have a constant rise over time? That's a great question. And you know, index funds are, they're set it and forget it money, mm -hmm. right? But what you're doing when you buy a stock or you buy a mutual fund is you're buying something and betting that someone's going to pay you more for that asset, that paper asset later, mm -hmm. right? You're not getting very many dividends. You're not getting very much cash flow. You're hoping someone pays you more for something later. So in real estate, there might be fluctuations in the market price, but I don't care because I'm getting cash flow and that's what I'm investing for. And the pre appreciation is just on the back end and that's a bonus. Mm -hmm. Another thing with real estate is you can force appreciation meaning you can make improvements either if you're active yourself or if you're in a syndication, the syndication operator will make improvements to the property that will increase the value of that property regardless of what the market is doing. If you're in index funds, you're coasting with the market. Yeah. If you're in real estate, 
you can create your own, the own, your own value in that asset and you're always receiving income oh, yeah. as you go. That makes sense. That makes sense because um, people will look at, you know, investing in stocks and in, in index funds and saying, you know, an index fund is like, uh, can you explain what an index fund is where it's spread over multiple companies? An index fund is where you pick an index. It could be the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest companies in the U.S., or it could be foreign stocks. And you basically invest in every one of those stocks mm -hmm. through a fund so that you're basically getting the returns of the market. Mm -hmm. But now it's looking like perhaps if everyone's investing in index funds, then you lose some of that advantage. And the, the reason people are so much into index funds now is because you don't have to pay someone to actively manage the fund, mm -hmm. right? So the expenses are much lower, so your returns are much higher. So it's similar in that they're both passive, what we do, the syndications and index funds, but that's really where it stops. And you'll see as we talk about all the advantages of real estate, um, that it's really a, a better way to go than the index funds. In right. My opinion. Right. I know. I agree because there's so many different ways that um, you know your investment. You can force appreciation on your investment. You can't force appreciation on an index fund. It is what it is. Right. The price is what it is, and it's it's going where it's going. So, so the index fund reduces risk because it kind of spreads your investment around, but. With real estate, aren't you a little bit overexposed because all your investment goes into this one thing? Yeah, that, that's a good point. So if I had $25,000 to invest in an index fund, it would be spread out over 100, 500 companies, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm investing in real estate syndication, usually the minimums are $25,000. So I'm in just one deal. But there are a lot of ways to spread the risk. You can invest in multiple deals with multiple sponsors. So you're with different operators. You're in different markets, so you maybe have one property in Phoenix and one in Dallas, different asset classes. So maybe you do multifamily apartments and then you also do self-storage. Mm -hmm. And then you can use uh, a company or a platform like TribeVest to reduce the minimums, mm -hmm. right? The minimum is $25,000, but if you go in with four of your friends, now you can get into these deals for $5,000. And so if you have $25,000 to invest through TribeVest, now you're in five different deals, maybe you're in three different markets, two different asset classes, wow. and that's how you get diversification and you decrease the risk of the investment. That's awesome. It's like you created your own stock market. <laughs> it's exactly right. And that's what you try to do is you try to balance it out with different investments, different places, and you're creating your own real estate syndication index. That's almost. awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. You know, uh, investing in real estate seems like it's, it's more difficult than just putting your money into these index funds. Just uh, in summary of this chapter, what would you say to somebody who's looking to invest some money and they, they're trying to make the decision between real estate and the stock market? Well, as with a lot of things, it's, it is complicated until you know and understand it and learn it a little bit. And the purpose of this webinar and the purpose of the left field investors is to educate people on alternative investments. I don't like that word because alternative means basically just not Wall Street stuff, yeah. right? But it's not alternative, it's the house you live, it's where you store your stuff at the self-storage facility. I mean, they're not, they're real assets. But there's, there's a bunch of benefits to real estate investing that you don't get from the stock market. And you'll learn about those throughout this webinar, but some of them are, there's significant tax advantages. You can use leverage to increase your returns. It's comparatively stable markets. You know, your, your asset values aren't going up and down as much. You have protection from inflation and consistent cash flow. And then the appreciation, that's just the bonus. All the other stuff is, is the best part. And then appreciation is like, you don't need it, but you love it when you get it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, stay tuned for the next episode. We mentioned a lot about syndication. We're going to be harping on that a little bit on the next one. Welcome back to the masterclass. We're now on to chapter two, syndications. Jim, what is a syndication? A syndication is basically just a pooling of capital to be able to go buy one, typically one, but maybe more properties. So it's typically a property that someone might not be able to purchase on their own. A good example is, let's say you want to buy a $20 million apartment building. Well, most people don't have $20 million sitting in the bank that they can go buy this apartment building with, but you think, okay, I'll go to the bank and get a loan for 75%. So there's 15 million you're gonna get from the bank. You still need another 5 million. Again. Most people don't have $5 million sitting in their pocket to go buy these properties. So what they do is the syndicator, the operator, we'll talk about that more later, they get maybe, let's say, 100 people to each put in $50,000, and now you have your $5 million for the down payment. And that's the syndication is the operation of running that apartment building now that you've bought it. 
Yeah, but a hundred people, that seems like a lot of people to get on the same page about an investment. Um, how do you get that many people on the same page? Um, that's a good question because what you do is they create an LLC, a limited liability company. That's just a, a way of owning something. And there's in an LLC, you can have general partners and limited partners. So the general partners are the operators, the syndicators, the people that are running and managing the deal. The limited partners are you and me. We're the investors. We're the ones giving them $50,000. We don't have any responsibilities after we give them that money. Now, when they operate, they have to do everything. They have to find the deal. They have to negotiate the deal. They have to sign all the documents and make sure that you know they get all the funding from us, the LPs, limited partners, mm -hmm. and also the bank. So they have to do all of that. And then once they've closed the deal, they have to operate it. They have to communicate with the LPs. They have to send out um, reports to the LPs. Hopefully they send distributions of cash to the LPs. And then they operate it. So they deal with what we talked about earlier, the tenants, termites, and toilets. Right? They have to repair things, and they manage the property. Another thing about syndications is it used to be really just reserved for the wealthy. Mm -hmm. But Congress. Uh, passed the 2012 Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. There's a regulation in there called Regulation D. You don't need to jump into the weeds and read that at all, but it talks about 506B syndications and 506C syndications, and that's usually what we're dealing with. What What is the difference between the 506B, C, D, and F? <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about D, E, and F, or yeah, just 506B <laughs> and 506C. Um, so they, they, there's two parts to each of those. One is what kind of investors they can allow into the deal. Mm -hmm. And the other is, are they allowed to advertise or not? And so the type of investors they're talking about, whether you're accredited or non-accredited. And accredited, they just broadened it. But accredited basically means you either have a million dollars in assets outside of your home, mm -hmm. or you earn, over the last couple of years, $200,000 or more if you're filing single, or $300,000 filing jointly. Now, there's also a couple little caveats. If you pass a few uh, securities tests, you can also become an accredited investor. And all that means is the accredited investor can, has access to a lot more deals. Mm -hmm. Now, I found through using TribeVest, one of my tribes, we had a bunch of non-accredited investors. And that really got me out there looking for non-accredited deals. And they're out there. And they're just as good as the others. And I invest in, in both. Uh, so there's not a, there, the only disadvantage to being non-accredited is you have a little bit less choice. Understood. It, um, in the housing market, you know, I'm an agent. When I um, am submitting offers, it seems that other agents rank different types of financing that comes through. You have the best, which is cash. Then you have conventional. Then you have FHA. You know, then you have VA and USDA. It sounds like when you're going to purchase deals, it's better to be an accredited investor rather than a non-accredited. But or is it is it non-accredited? Yep. Yeah. Uh, but using platforms like TribeVest, like you said, you can become a an accredited investor by using your whole team, or is it just a group of non-accredited investors now have access to something um, that normally only an accredited investor would have access to? Yeah. The, the way that TribeVest helps is not really with the accreditation, because if you're not a, if one person in your group is non-accredited then your whole group is not accredited. If they're on the LLC? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. But what TribeVest allows you to do is, like I have a group I'll talk about later, that we contribute 100 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. So it's real small stakes, but you can get into these syndications. And so all these people in this group with me are non-accredited. Mm -hmm. So the investment opportunities out there, I didn't think were equal to what an accredited person could invest in. And right. in fact, they're not. But there are plenty of syndicators who target the non-accredited groups and will let you in their deals. So it's not as big of a disadvantage as I original, originally thought. This used to be for the wealthy, mm -hmm. and the wealthy still have some advantages, but the regular person can get in it too. Got it, got it. Okay, so let's assume that I have $50,000 to put into a syndication. Why not just go off and buy a single family home on my own? A lot of people do start in active investing, doing wholesaling or buying single family mm -hmm. homes as we talked about in the last chapter. But the reason why you might want to put it into a syndication is because it's passive. You don't have to do anything. After you've decided on the investment, decided on the sponsor, all that stuff that we're going to talk about, then you turn over the operational duties to somebody else. Somebody professionally who is trained to do this and only this runs your, 
real estate operation for you, mm -hmm. right? I was investing in a actively in my own stuff, and I thought, why don't I just have a professional do it? Because I have my regular job, and now I'm trying to manage a single family home on the side. It's much more effective to have somebody else do it professionally, and the returns, honestly, are not that much less than I was getting on the active stuff. Mm -hmm. So how are the profit return splits different between the general partners and the limited partners? So the general partners, sometimes they don't even put any money into the deal. They, a lot of them, you like to have them invest as LPs and BGPs at the same time. So general partner, limited partner. So they invest some of their money as limited partners. Mm -hmm. But the general partner, they're doing all the work. So, but we're providing all the money. Mm -hmm. So you have to split up the proceeds, right? So typically what they do is they, they usually, a lot of syndications offer a preferred return. The preferred return is also called a PREF. And what that is basically, it's usually between six and 10%. And they say, okay, I'm gonna pay you every month 7% out of cash flow from the, how the prop, based on how the property is doing. Mm -hmm. So if one quarter they only pay you 4%, they have to make up the rest. And so at the end, when they're selling the property, that's when they make up, if they haven't paid that 7% consistently, mm -hmm. the first thing they'll do is they'll make up that 7% and make us make the LPs whole mm -hmm. right on our cash flows. Then they'll return all of the capital. So that's your initial $50,000 investment or whatever it is. And then everything else is split based on a predetermined amount. Usually it's 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40 with the, with the bulk of it going to the um, LPs. And that, that is all taken care of on the back end, if that makes sense. No, it does. So they're guaranteed a certain amount. There's no guarantees. Okay. And, and if you ever, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. If you ever get an operator offering you a guarantee, you say thank you, no thank you, and you exit. Because they can't <laughs> guarantee anything. That's yeah. not, not um, it's, I don't know if it's against the law necessarily, but they should not be guaranteeing you returns. What a preferred return is, it means that you get paid, the LP gets paid before the uh, GP gets anything. Mm -hmm. So if the deal goes south and, no, and, and there's only 5%, returns on this, mm -hmm. the GP gets nothing. So the, it's basically, they're paid for their performance, but to get you to invest, they wanna say, hey, I'm gonna make sure you get 7% um, as we go through the, the investment. Now it's not guaranteed, it might not get 7%, but when they sell the asset, that's when they backfill and uh, pay you for all the, anything that they had missed. So in a syndication, who typically gets more, a limited partner or a general partner? Well, the limited partner will get more cash, mm -hmm. but they also put in more, more cash where the GP didn't put anything in. Um, they put it in on the LP side, but they're not putting anything in other than their sweat equity, equity right? Mm -hmm. So they're not putting anything in. The other thing to look for is the transaction and operational fees. So the GP also gets paid for that. There's um, acquisition fees, perhaps, disposition fees. So they might get 1% of the total value of the property when they buy it. And that's just so they can do all their due diligence and, and cover all of their expenses. And then there could be other fees. There's an asset management fee usually of two to 3% for that's paid annually because they're managing that asset. And so there's other fees that you have to look for when you're investing, but the typical ones are acquisition, which is when you buy it, mm -hmm. disposition, when you sell it, and then the ongoing is the asset management fee. There's fees for each each of those levels is what you're saying, acquisitions fee, dis dispositions fee, and then management fee? Manage asset management fee, that's the one that's recurring. Mm -hmm. The others are typically one-time fees. You buy it, you pay them one, per they get 1% of the total purchase price, and that's for all the work that they're doing up front. And then they get same percent, usually a 1% on the back end, um, because they're not, they're not getting the cash flow as you go, and that's what, that's what they need the asset management fee, because they manage the whole property, they manage the, they usually hire a property manager, so that's mm -hmm. a separate fee, but that's that's not paid to the general partners. Mm -hmm. The general partners get an asset management fee. Okay, so if I wanna invest in this syndication, which I kinda do with this $50,000, what's the process? <laughs> well, for the LP, all the active stuff is up front. You have to do your due diligence, and we'll talk about all of this coming up in later chapters, but you need to vet the sponsor, decide on a market, pick the asset class, and then vet the deal, right? So there's a lot of upfront stuff. After that, you're not really doing anything. But left field investors, the, the community that I'm part of, there's tools that we have will help you along the way. So one of the most important parts is vetting the sponsor, which we'll go into detail later. But left field investors has a sponsor screener tool that helps you, helps the new investor come up with the questions to ask when you're talking to the sponsor for the first time. Mm. And so that's part of it, you have to screen the sponsor. Then you have to 
pick the market, like I said, screen the deal. And for the deal, we also at Left Field Investors, we have a deal analyzer, which basically we'll talk about a little bit later. It takes some metrics. You put those metrics in and you make sure the deal kind of checks all the boxes. Mm -hmm. We don't want to re-underwrite the deal. That's what the sponsor should be doing for us. But we do want to make check and make sure that it hits all the right numbers that we're looking at. After you analyze the deal, then you're going to get a bunch of documents from the sponsor, the GP. What are these documents? Yeah, so you get the private placement memorandum. They call it the PPM. It's 100, 200 pages with all the things that can go wrong. It's all for the lawyers. The lawyers write it, the lawyers read it. Yeah. I recommend when you get into a deal with a new sponsor, you read it, you look at it, and you know, you're know you not going to read every word. It's a lot. Nope. But there's ways, and, and we talk about that. Part of the community aspect of this is people know, hey, look for this, look for that in the PPM. And, and that's one of the things you need to do. There's also an operating agreement for the LLC because each property that you buy is going to have its own LLC. So you want to check out the operating agreement. And then there's subscription agreements that you have to sign. And that's where the operator is getting information about you. How are you investing as an individual or as an LLC? They need your social security number and some other, your address, your phone, all the private information. After that, you send the wire and then you just wait for the cash to roll in. After you've invested, you've sent your wire, money's coming in, then you'll get monthly or quarterly distribution checks and reports. So you need to read those and you'll find out how your property's doing. And then around March 15th, tax time, you'll get a K-1. And that's a specific document that lays out how the taxes are paid. And we'll talk about that later. But you have to be on the lookout for the K-1. And the next thing you do is you wait around for the next year and eventually the deal sells and then you collect your capital and the appreciation. Nice. That concludes chapter two. We're going to move on to chapter three. Welcome back to the master class. It's time for chapter three with passive syndications, pros and cons. So, so far syndications sound pretty cool, but I'm sure there's some downsides. What are some of those? Yeah. So I think the major downside to syndications is you're giving up control and li and there's they're very illiquid, mm -hmm. right? So when you buy into one of these deals, it's going to be three years at a minimum probably, and could be five or 10 years before you can get your capital back. So you don't have a lot of liquidity. There's no secondary market to sell these. So that, that can be a downside. What is liquidity? Liquidity is having cash, right? Cash is liquid, mm -hmm. but if you go buy a house, it's not liquid because if you need money, you got to sell the house and that takes time. Okay. So, so liquidity access to your cash. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's a great way to put it. So you lose liquidity with these, which mm. is a definite downside. You also don't have control over the asset. But I would say if you're investing in the stock market, you also don't have control, but you do have liquidity. And that, you know, not to turn all of the downsides into upsides, but not having liquidity sometimes can be a good thing. Last year when we had the pandemic and the stock market dropped 30%, if you sold at the low and stayed out, the liquidity hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. But in the real estate market, I wasn't selling. I just help because I had to mm -hmm. and the, everything came back and so you don't you don't end up having the panic selling as much so that it is a downside to have that illiquidity and you need to know that going in before you invest in one but it can also save you so you should not never invest in a syndication money that you think you're going to need in the next five years or yeah something. yeah sometimes it's good not to have access to too much money because the more access you have to it the more you'll spend <laughs> exactly That's yeah exactly right. is that the only downside the liquidity Another downside is the minimums, right? The minimum investment is, is $25,000 or it could be up to $100,000. Mm -hmm. So to get into, we talked about, and we'll talk more about diversifying. You know, if you can only, if you need $25,000 to get into a deal, how many deals can the regular person get into in a year? So that's a real challenge. And that's where TribeVest has a great solution, right? TribeVest, as we talked about before, allows groups to pool their money together. So you can get into, if you have $25,000 to invest, you could get it, if you have a group of five, now you can get into five deals instead of just one. Mm -hmm. So again, it is a downside that the, the investment uh, minimums are so high, but you can get around that by group investing. So we talked a little bit about K-1s. Those are a tax document that, so the L, this is getting in the weeds a little bit, but I think it's important. The LLC does not pay taxes. It's a pass-through entity. So it passes through its tax burden to all of the LPs, all of the owners. Mm -hmm. And they do that through a K-1. And the K-1 is the document you get. It's like a 1099 mm -hmm. that people get for their stock market. But the K-1 will list losses, gains. It just lists a bunch of stuff that your accountant will look at and put in a bucket. And then that tax comes directly to you. So the problem is those aren't filed usually until March 15th, March 31st, something like that. 
So if you're going to file your taxes on time on April 15th, you have to know that your K-1s are coming in on time so you can do your own tax return. So every investment you do in a syndication is going to send you a different K-1. Mm -hmm. So now you are adding up some accounting costs. If you have an accountant, every K-1 they're going to charge you for, and it is a little bit, it complicates things. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'll take that complication and that little extra you know, work that my accountant might have to do for the benefits of syndication investing, which we've talked about. So a couple other minor uh, downsides or obstacles maybe is you have to, to do the deal, you're gonna have to wire 25,000, 50,000, $100,000 to someone you probably haven't met. Mm -hmm. You've had a few conversations with them, so you really need to vet the sponsor and become comfortable enough to be able to send that money out. Another thing is the PPM we talked about, right? Private placement memorandum. It could be 100 pages, 200 pages. Dealing with those documents is frustrating. It's time consuming to dig through them. So it's just an added layer of, of friction, right? But all of those things I think uh, you, you get around when you, when you start getting to the upsides, which hopefully we'll talk about next. Yeah, I won't, definitely want to get into the upsides and I'm hoping there are some after all those downsides. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, one of the biggest upsides is the tax, right? If, if you're investing or anytime you're making money, the biggest not risk factor, but the biggest factor working against you is taxes. And you can reduce, defer, even eliminate almost all of the tax when you invest in real estate. Because the tax code is written to um, benefit, part of it is written to benefit real estate investors, mm -hmm. right? So there's depreciation, which means the useful life of something is less and less as it gets older. So you can use that depreciation to offset almost all of your passive gains. So if you're doing it right, when you're investing in a syndication, you will not pay tax on any of the cash flows you receive. It will be deferred probably, and you have to recapture later. Um, and we'll talk about that, but it's your, your tax bill is gonna go way down the more syndications you invest in. But your, your accountant needs to know about all of the benefits. Yes, it's very important that you have a, an accountant that understands real estate mm -hmm. and preferably someone who invests in real estate themselves because there's depreciation and there's a different, there's, a, there's something called bonus depreciation, mm -hmm. which means instead of depreciating part of the building every year, you can depreciate it all up front. So companies do what's called a cost segregation. Again, fancy term, you get engineers in the building and they run their numbers and they figure out what can depreciate when. And so if you can get let's say you invest $50,000 in a syndication. I've had syndications come back with a, the K-1, which says what the taxes are, that I have a $55,000 loss in the first year. Mm -hmm. So I've already received some income from this property, but for tax purposes, I have a $55,000 loss. I can use that to offset income from that syndication. Also, I can use that to offset income from any real estate transaction that I have. So. If you keep this bucket of losses, anytime you win, you just eat away at it. Mm -hmm. And then there is depreciation recapture at the end. And this is where when you sell the building, remember all that bonus depreciation I talked about that you took as a loss? Mm -hmm. Now you have to recapture it. And so that's where you would be taxed. However, you just made some money, right? Because mm -hmm. you sold the investment. Now if you take that same money and go invest it in a new deal. 1031 exchange. Not a 1031 exchange. My accountant calls it a lazy 1031. <laughs> so a 1031 exchange is where you can defer tax by buying a, a similar property, mm -hmm. right? The lazy 1031 is instead of buying a similar property, you just buy another syndication. You get another round of bonus depreciation to offset the recapture you just had. I know this is getting complicated, but basically somebody in my network calls it the golden hamster wheel, mm -hmm. right? You get on this thing, you have this depreciation. When you sell, you recapture it, but then you go buy a new asset and you get the bonus depreciation again that cancels out that recapture and mm -hmm. you just keep going. It kind of it sounds like the Burr method of tax. <laughs> it is, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good way of looking at it. It's, it's like, yeah. you know, if, as long as you keep going. It's a rinse and repeat. Right, you, you, can, you can defer most of your tax and so mm -hmm. you, you'll make this money and you won't be taxed on it. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're getting a better return in the stock market, which personally I don't think you do, you have to pay tax on it. There's no way to defer that tax. Mm -hmm. This tax you can push off and the longer you push off the tax, the better it is for you in your financial situation. Oh man, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. You gotta pay taxes immediately with gains in the stock market. 
like there is no rollover or 1031 exchange for stock or, or a lazy 1031 right. with stock market gains. Exactly. That's right. so true. And, and taxes are the biggest obstacle to creating wealth mm -hmm. and real estate removes that obstacle. Mm -hmm. Well, this is sounding great so far. What are the other benefits? So we talked about it a little bit already, but diversification, right? I think that's a great benefit uh, that, that people don't think of when you're thinking of real estate because they think, oh, I just can, I can only afford this one property. But again, if you use things like TribeVest or a way to get into multiple uh, syndications, then you do have that um, diversification. And the group investing is another advantage. You can't really group invest in the stock market, mm -mm. right? But group investing, what it does, it not only reduces the minimums, but also gives you confidence, right? When I found out somebody else in my network was investing in the same deal as I was, I thought, oh, man, this is a smart guy. So now I have somebody else is doing the same thing. And that community of group investing uh, really just kind of solidifies a lot of what you're doing because you understand other people are doing it too. Mm -hmm. Are there any other benefits? Yeah, th there's a bunch and we're not going to go through them all. But another one is the management of the asset, right? You don't have to manage it. You, you do a lot of upfront work and then you give your money to somebody else and they manage the asset and just return money to you. So I think that's a, that's a great um, advantage. There's also different investing strategies, just like in the stock market, if you want to buy foreign index funds, and U.S. funds, there's all kinds of different options. And it's the same way. There's a bunch of different asset classes. And if you really want to get into it, you can invest uh, overseas as well. So there's a lot of ways to diversify and distribute your, your investments. Um, a couple other things I'd like to, to mention is one is community. Again, either through TribeVest, Leftfield Investors, or whatever community you're in, just working with other people and, and, and creating a group so you can talk and understand. And that's how much you, you just accelerate your learning process and you can get into so many different things. There's also one thing that I really like, one of the biggest advantages other than tax advantages, it's velocity of money. What do you mean by velocity of money? So you, you don't want your money just sitting still, right? So you want to keep it moving mm -hmm. into multiple assets. So an example, let's say you invest your $25,000 in a real estate syndication. And that syndicator goes and they try to force the equity mm -hmm. to grow, right? So they force appreciation. And they do that by rehabbing the apartments. They might do dog fences around um, lower level apartments and charge an extra 50 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you charge an extra 50 bucks a month rent, it seems like a small thing. Or when you spend $5,000 rehabbing an apartment and you only raise the rent 100 bucks, I mean, do the math. It takes forever to pay that off. But you're thinking of it wrong. What that does is that $100 increase in rent is $1,200 a year. And if you do that on 100 apartments, now you've increased the income of that property, which then increases the value of the property, mm -hmm. right? So you do a little thing that increases the value because you're using leverage multiple times. So what ends up happening, the velocity of money is you do all these improvements, or the operator does, right? You're an LP, so you just sit back. You're not doing anything, but the GP does, they improve the property. Then they go to the bank and they say, hey, you know that building that was worth $20 million? It's now worth $30 million. I'd like a new loan. And the bank says, okay. And they give you the loan, right? Now, what does the, the operator do with all that cash? They send it back to you. So now let's say they did it so you're 25 grand invested. In two years, they give you your $25,000 back. Mm -hmm. You still own that asset. You're still getting cash flow from that asset, but you have your capital back and you go put it in a new deal. Wow. Now you have $25,000 that you invested. Now you own two cash flowing properties and it just snowballs. So velocity of money is putting your money into action and not letting it just sit there. But as soon as you get the, the uh, initial investment back, you go do another one and now you have two sets of returns. Man, that would be a dream investment to invest $25,000 and then get it back in a couple of years and continue to get a paycheck from that initial investment. That would right. be amazing. I'd give you 50 the next time. All right, give it to me. Oh, <laughs> way my account set up. That does it for chapter three. You know it comes after three, right? <laughs> Welcome back to the master class. Chapter four, we're gonna be talking about how to pick a sponsor. All right, so we've mentioned picking a sponsor, uh, but how do you find somebody that you like, know, and trust? This is the most important part of syndication investing. So if you've skipped all the other chapters, you're in the right spot picking this one to start with because this, this is critical. Because you can have a, a great investment run by a bad sponsor and it's gonna be horrible. Or you can have a bad investment run by a great sponsor and they can maybe save it, right? So you need to make sure that you're getting a good sponsor. And there's a lot of ways to vet the sponsor, but it's complicated because you're only gonna to get to talk to them 
for a half hour for a couple of calls. You know, maybe you can go visit them, but that's not practical for every deal. So picking the sponsor is critical. And one of the best ways is to use your network. I know I keep talking about community, mm -hmm. but that's really, really where it's at. So if you have a community like Left Field Investors or Tribe Best, talk to the people in that community. Hey, have you ever heard of this syndicator? And that's what we do in our community. We have a list of syndicators that we haven't screened them, but we've talked to them all. And so they're trusted. That, yeah. And, and that gives everybody a little bit of a head start. Um, ask people, refer, refer me to your, your, your favorite sponsor. Uh, Left Field Investors website has a long list of sponsors that we've talked to and that we understand that we think, you know, I'm, we, we don't endorse them necessarily, but mm -hmm. that, that's how, and if it's not left field investors, go to another community and find, find sponsors that, that they like. Um, so you need to find some sponsors, get some background info, and then dig deep and do some research on them. Yeah. Google is your friend on this one, it sounds like. Exactly right. But what kind of information should I be looking for with these sponsors? So one of the biggest ones is experience. How long have they been doing this? Because right now, I mean, the last, what, 10 years, the real estate market has been great. Yeah. Right? It's, hard, it's hard to lose money. So what you want is an experienced operator. If you can find someone who's been doing it for 15 or 20 years and they've been through some of the bad markets, that's great. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the syndicator. It could be a new syndicator that has a real estate person who's had that track record. So mm -hmm. track record is important. Um, if you could find a sponsor who's had exited deals, Right? Because these deals take three, five, ten years before they go full cycle. And full cycle means purchase, operate, sell. So you want to see how many deals have they exited. So do they have experience that they can sell and, and do the deals they did when they sold them? Did they match up with their predictions you know, five years before when, mm -hmm. they, when they bought it? Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. Is you're looking for experience. You're looking for people who have exits. Those are some of the things to look for. So you can kind of see their stat sheet. You can see what their shooting percentage is. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The other thing, you know, compared to basketball, right? Scouting. Mm -hmm. You go. You you read their website. Mm -hmm. Find out what they're saying. You listen to their podcast. You like you would watch someone play, right? If they're saying all this stuff in their podcast, then you got to see. All right, are they checking it? Are they doing it? Yeah. And part of the thing now with podcasting is there are some really, really good syndication marketers mm -hmm. out there. Now, are they really good syndication operators? I don't know. Some of them are better marketers than they are operators. Mm -hmm. And so part of the challenge is you have to figure out which one are they. Are they a marketer? Are they operator? Or are they both? Because mm -hmm. that, that could be the case too. And that's where referrals and research helps you out. All right. So what happens during a typical call when you're on the phone with one of these sponsors? So, yeah. They have to screen you just like you're screening them, right? The Regulation D that we talked about has a bunch of rules for they have to know and have an existing relationship with you depending on how they structured their deal, right? It might, might be that they can advertise. It might be that they can't. So almost every time you want to invest in a deal, you'll have to call and talk to the sponsor. Mm -hmm. Might be 30 minutes, might be an hour. And so what they're going to do is they're going to ask you questions. They're going to want to find out if you're accredited. They want to know if you've done deals before. They're trying to kind of scope you out to see if you're, you're worth their time. Mm. And then after that, then they're going to talk about themselves, their operation, what typical deals they do, and, and they just kind of give you an overview because they're kind of selling to you, right? So what we do at Left Field Investors is we came up with a thing we call the sponsor screener. Because the first time you call, and I've dealt with a lot of first-time investors, and they say, what am I supposed to say? I don't know what to say. And the syndicator, the operator, kind of runs it. But... If you have a list, we have a list of questions that you ask. So you just listen, take notes, and then if they don't ask some of the questions on, or if they don't answer some of the questions on our list, then you just ask them those questions, and they'll, you know, they'll give you their answers, and then you kind of take that in and evaluate it. The other thing is, you're not just listening for facts; you're listening for feelings. Mm -hmm. I know this is really hard, but if you have a gut feeling like oh, I just don't know, they seem kind of shifty. They, I'm not sure about them listen to that yeah right do not invest if you because the only i've been in a couple of bad deals and i probably should have been able to figure it out just from the first call don't get so excited about investing in a deal that you overlook the sponsor there are plenty of sponsors if you get a bad feeling about one even if other people have said they're great move on to the next one that concludes chapter four on to the next one Welcome back to the master class. This is now chapter five, and we're gonna focus on how to pick an asset class. Jim, how do you decide what asset class to invest in? Well, you gotta start first by knowing what are the options, right? And there are a lot of options. 
So you have the first, the most popular, multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks. That's mm -hmm. what everyone's after these days. You also have triple net leases, either industrial or commercial. Now, triple net means the tenant pays real estate, taxes, maintenance, and repairs, and the insurance. Oh, I like that. <laughs> exactly. It's like a triple, triple double. Yeah, triple nets are great. I yeah. love those too. Um, and then office and retail are pretty common also, but they are not as popular now given the pandemic and what that's done to those, those industries. What are some other classes? So some of the lesser known classes would be ATM machines, uh, private notes, so mortgage notes, private lending, assisted living facilities, resort properties, agriculture, student housing, oil and gas, and then development. That's a pretty long list. I wouldn't even know where to start. You start with what you know, right? So you probably have lived in an apartment at some point. You, you might have used a self-storage unit at some time. You've probably used an ATM before. Right, so start with the things that you know and understand and then branch out from there and figure out, is there something else I could do? Um, you know, a lot of people, I talked about this, a lot of people get started flipping single family homes and then they move on to maybe buy and hold and then they move on to uh, maybe buying small commercial multifamily properties. And so if you do that, you'll get, an, you'll get a sense of, okay, now I'm gonna get into this syndication thing and do it passively and so then maybe you go into an apartment building. And then you learn about apartment buildings and you learn how great those are. And then you think, everyone's talking about mobile home parks. Well, now you have some experience with investing in places where people live. Now you say, okay, how do I transfer that to a mobile home park? So you just kind of keep going, use your community. Mm -hmm. That's where I, you know, I keep saying that life, uh, left field investors and tribe best, they help you learn more stuff, right? So you could talk to other people that are investing in these other assets mm -hmm. and find out what works best for you. Because there's some people that specialize in, in one or the other and their syndicators, usually the syndicators only do one thing, uh, but they're branching out also. So you gotta make sure that they, for example, one of the, one of the syndicators I really like, they're multi-family properties, that's all they ever did. They started into self-storage. Mm -hmm. Now, if they try to do that themselves, there's no chance I would invest with them. Yeah. But what they did is they hired a self-storage expert as a full-time employee who's done it for 30 years. And so, okay, now I can, now I can go and, and evaluate the, their deals. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because now they're bringing expertise into the deal with them. Right. Um, with all of these different asset classes, is there one that's like more safe than the other? I know as I'm looking at this list, the first one that I actually got involved in was probably mobile home parks. I purchased my first real piece of real estate, <laughs> it's not even real estate, was a mobile home. Um, and I bought it for like $1,000, fixed it up and resold it for like $7,000. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, it's difficult to know what is the safest. I, one, of the, one thing that people say a lot is you always need a place to live, mm -hmm. right? So if you're investing in multifamily apartments or you're investing in mobile homes, there, people are always going to need those. So that might be the safest, but really all of these are an asset, right? It's a real asset. It's not a piece of paper. You're investing in an asset. So it's very rare that any of these go to zero. Is there risk? Yes. I think the risk is a lot less in real estate and most of these assets than other things that you're in. But then if you're going to do resort investing or you're going to do retail or office right now, you know, right after a pandemic, those, yeah, those might have a little bit more risk or um, assisted living facilities, mm -hmm. right? You're waiting for demographics to make those a great investment, but yeah. they, they probably will be. So it's, you just have to do your research and understand, you know, where you're comfortable, start there, mm -hmm. and then you'll see, you'll, you'll start branching out. And um, one of the things that, that everyone talks about in our, in our group is the shiny object syndrome. Oh yeah, yeah. So shiny object syndrome, I, I think of it as the movie from Up, you know, Squirrel, where the dog goes <laughs> Squirrel running around. And I had that, right? I was, when I first started in passive investing, I had an, an old uh, 401k, right? That I rolled over so, and I turned it into a, um, something I could invest out of. And that's a whole different story. But I was investing in all kinds of different stuff that I didn't vet properly because I didn't know what I was doing yet because I had that shiny object syndrome. Someone mm -hmm. would I'd be talking to you and someone would say squirrel and I'd run over there and go invest in whatever they told me to invest in. Yeah. And so that's part of why we started Left Field Investors was to give people, okay, you can still do the shiny object and run around, but maybe just invest in things that you know and understand. Is there a strategy involved when it comes to selecting your asset class you want to invest in? 
Yeah, I think after you've kind of gotten through the beginning stage where you're only investing in a couple things, and most people probably start with multifamily homes and, and, that, and multifamily apartment buildings, and that, that's probably a smart way to start. Then you need to start thinking where do things fit in your investment portfolio? Are you investing for cash flow? Are you investing for appreciation? Mm -hmm. Are you investing for both? So an example would be if you're investing, uh, if you're doing private lending, right? You're not going to get any appreciation there. So if you're trying to grow your wealth, you know, private lending probably isn't the best place to do that. If you're investing for um, cash flow, you might want to invest in ATMs. Mm -hmm. And there's no appreciation there. You just get cash every month, and then at the end, you know, you're, you've been paid back plus some, but there's no asset left. It's literally cash flow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you have to match what you're doing with everything else. And also, if you want major tax write-offs, again, ATMs is a, is a good investment and others aren't as good. So you need to try to match your strategy to the asset class. And as you grow and learn and get into the syndication space, you will find all these different asset classes that you didn't know of. And then you can start picking, you know, picking the right one for the strategy at the time. So when I first started, I had sold all of my multifamily properties. So I had a big tax liability. Mm -hmm. My accountant said, you need to do a lazy 1031, right? So what I did was I found a syndicator who did a great job of doing that bonus depreciation that we talked talked about that gave me these big losses that I could use to offset my gains. Mm -hmm. So that's why I picked that strategy. But then I kept investing with that operator because I liked them, but I had I was I had switched and now I needed cash flow, right? Because I wasn't working my W2 job anymore. Mm -hmm. So now I was investing in these deals that didn't have a lot of cash flow, but that's what I needed. And so I then I realized, okay, I need to change my strategy because I've written off all this tax liability I can now I need to go start investing for cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how you do it. You have to figure out what you're looking for. You want to diversify, but you don't want to diversify just for the sake of diversifying. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you have a good strategy for how you're accumulating your assets and how they all work together. Mm -hmm. When you say um, you're able to record major losses when you went with that, that uh, syndicator, it was be as a result of you investing in that syndication. That, that reflects a loss on your taxes? Yeah, so it's the it's the bonus depreciation, the mm. cost segregation that we talked about yeah. earlier. So that's that's the one where I invested fifty thousand dollars, and on my K one they sent me back a fifty five thousand dollar loss. Yeah, which was great because it's a paper loss, and what that does is I can offset that fifty five thousand dollars can offset the gain I had from selling another property. So if I had a capital gain of sixty thousand mm dollars, -hmm. now I only have a five thousand dollar gain, and so instead of paying taxes on sixty thousand or whatever the numbers were. I'm only paying on five thousand, mm -hmm. okay. and that's where you make your money, right? Because now you're not paying tax. Mm -hmm. So that concludes chapter five. On to the next chapter. Welcome back to the master class. We're now on to chapter six. We are flying through this thing. Now you talked about how to pick a sponsor and an asset class. Uh, the third way you talked about was diversifying by market. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so you want to be in different markets. You don't want to be in all, you know, everything in Dallas. You want mm -hmm. to diversify a little bit. But you want to be in good markets. So you have to find markets where um, sometimes the popular markets are a good place to start. Right now it's Phoenix, Dallas, Atlanta. Those are some of the popular markets. Um, it's also, I think, I like to look for off markets that, that aren't popular yet, like Boise um, is one, Colorado Springs is another one. So you want to find markets that are either good now or are going to be good. Well, what separates a good market from a not so good market? One of the main factors to call it a good market is population growth, mm -hmm. right? You want people to be moving there. So whatever the reason is or why, why they're moving, a lot of people are moving to Dallas, a lot of people are moving to Texas, to Florida, all, you know, some of the Sun Belt states, Arizona. So the more people there are, the more they're going to need real estate, mm -hmm. right? So you follow the population growth. Another good aspect of a market would be where the state has good landlord tenant laws, meaning in favor of the landlord, mm -hmm. or they have uh, no taxes like Florida, you mm -hmm. know, so there's no state income tax. So that helps you out. Um, there could be, they just have nice business regulations that are business friendly. So all of these things make a good market. You also want job growth. And if people are moving there, they're generally moving there for jobs, but you want strong, stable and diversified jobs. So you don't want to, you know, go to a, a town that maybe a military town because if the military pulls out, then there's no jobs left. So you want to have um, a diverse economy with a lot of different employers. And hopefully, you could get a place where uh, major companies are moving their headquarters or they're moving large you know, groups of people there. 
And so you just, job growth and population growth are, are some of the big factors. Well, you've labeled what a good market is. What's a not so good market? Well, I would say it's kind of just the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's people are leaving um, or there's high regulation. So a bad market would be, you know, um, a place like maybe New York that has high cost of living, people are moving out, there's high regulations. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't always have to be a bad market. Mm -hmm. I'm also investing with a guy in New York because he's a local guy and everyone looks at New York and says, bad market, not going there. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a local guy. He knows, the, he knows the, how the rent control works. He knows how everything works. People have to live, right, somewhere. Yep. So he is successful there. Mm -hmm. Now, I typically don't go in New York for my investments, but you find little pockets. And so part of it is you want to find either a good market or find an operator who has a good story in a bad market because that can be an advantage too. And other things you can do when you, when you get an actual deal is you can go onto Google Maps and just take a tour, right? See what, what's around it. Mm -hmm. You could be in a, in a place that is a, you know, a bad neighborhood, but they, they're building a brand new Walgreens across the street. Well, Walgreens does a ton of research. So mm -hmm. if they're building there, chances are that neighborhood's gonna turn around, yeah. right? You can go on Trulia and they have a crime map. And so what I do is I type the address in, put it on Trulia, and I just, I'm just looking for how blue is it compared to the, to the neighboring places, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things you can do to look at the, so you wanna analyze the overall market, but then when you're analyzing a specific deal, then you look at the, the sub market and the very small area where the property is. Right, right. One other thing that might be helpful when you're trying to select a market is a market that you're familiar with. Right? If you grew up in Indianapolis and you know something that everybody else doesn't, then that might be a good place to invest in because mm -hmm. you know how the market operates. Also, again, I keep saying it, use your community. Right? If you want to know what a good market is, ask some other people that are investing there. Mm -hmm. So that concludes chapter six. On to the next chapter. We'll see you there. Okay, Jim, so we've screened a sponsor, we selected an asset class, and we picked a few of our favorite markets. Now we're getting into deal flow. How do we choose the deal we wanna invest in? That's a great question. I, now I'm a passive investor. I do not wanna re-underwrite the deal. That's the job of the sponsor, right? So I've done a great deal of work evaluating the sponsor, getting to know, like, and trust the sponsor, and I understand that um, they know what they're doing and I'm confident in them. So I don't want to I don't want to do their job and, and dig in to everything and, and figure everything out from scratch, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's their job. Now that I have confidence in them, I'm going to trust that the deal meets most of my metrics. So, but I still want to check. I still want to make sure. And the funny thing is, this is probably the shortest chapter: how to analyze the deal. Because what you really want to do is make sure you have the right sponsor, mm -hmm. the right asset class, and the right market. Those are the tough parts. Now, when the deal comes, you look at it and you're like okay, I knew this was coming. Mm -hmm. And so what we do at Left Field Investors, we created what we call a deal analyzer. And so we take maybe 30 different metrics and we put them in our deal analyzer and it basically, it's an Excel spreadsheet that turns green if it fits mm -hmm. our parameters and red if it doesn't. And so red doesn't mean don't invest. Red means this generates a question. And how I use this is as another check on the sponsor. I'm checking the deal to make sure it fits my metrics, and we'll talk about a few of those. Mm -hmm. But I really am also checking the sponsor. So what happens is, let's say I get five red flags. So I'm gonna contact the sponsor and say, hey, I got questions on these five things. Now, I'm not as concerned with what the answer is. I'm more concerned with how it's answered. Are you responsive? Do you get back to me within 24 hours? It sounds like that's a little too nitpicky, but if you don't get back to me before I've given, me, given you my money, are you gonna get back to me after you have my money? Probably not, so that's a test. The other is, how do you answer my questions? Do you know the answers or, or is it difficult for you or, or are you, do you get upset that I'm asking questions? All of those are red flags. Like most sponsors are gonna give me very detailed answers. Mm -hmm. and that makes me not only feel better about the deal, but it also makes me feel better about the sponsor. So I focus on the metrics through the deal analyzer and, and that's how I, that's how I vet a deal. Yeah, I like that. Um, well, let's bring up these metrics. Uh, what are some different metrics that you look at? So, like I said, there's about 30 of them on that, on that tool that we use, but everybody I think has their favorites. And some of the favorites that I have are rent growth, right? I wanna see that there's, and this is all looking at the pro forma. I wanna see that they've had reasonable rent growth. I don't wanna see 10% rent growth in year one. What's a pro forma? Oh, thank you. So pro forma is, 
kind of a prediction of how they think the property, the financials will perform over the next three, five, ten years, however long their time horizon is for that um, investment. So you're looking at, they do full financial reports based on assumptions that they make, mm -hmm. and that's the pro forma. So the rent growth pro forma, if they say they're going to get rent increases of 10% in year one, I, I wonder how they do that. Yeah. Because most of the leases don't, you know, they come due every, you know, on all kinds of different dates. So how are you going to get everyone up 10% immediately? You're not. Mm -hmm. So a lot mm -hmm. of uh, syndicators will use, you know, overly aggressive assumptions on rent growth. So, but if I see one that's two or 3% every year consistent rent growth, that makes sense because you not only, and it depends also if they're a value add property, which means an old property where they've put a bunch of work into it, you should be able to get more rent increase, right? Maybe you get 4% a year. If it's a property that was just built three years ago and there's no work to do to it, you might only get one or 2%, but those numbers have to be consistent. They have to make sense based on the property. Mm -hmm. What are some other more important metrics? So another one I like is break even occupancy. So break-even occupancy is the, the amount of vacancy you can have and have the property still break even. Mm. So that just gives you, that shows you how much buffer you have. And I like to see at least 80%, um, you know, no higher than 80% break even because if something goes wrong and occupancy drops to 90 or 85%, I know that we're still making money and we would break even at the 80% mark. So mm. the, the lower that number, the better. Um, another one, that I like that I, I didn't even understand before was economic vacancy. So it's not vacancy, it's economic vacancy. And when I owned single family properties, I always threw in 5% for vacancy, mm -hmm. right? Just in my underwriting and evaluations. Right. Well, there's more to vacancy than just someone not being in an apartment, right? So economic vacancy includes uh, vacancy, concessions, which is, you know, throw in a, a free month's rent or a TV if you sign now or mm -hmm. something like that. Bad debt, which means uncollectible, you know, stuff you didn't collect. Loss to lease, which is the major one. So loss to lease is if the market rate for an apartment that, that like you have is a thousand bucks and you're only collecting 800, that's, lot, that's $200 of loss to lease. Oh. And so that's a real driver, right? If you have a big loss to lease, you can, you, and you get a, rid of that, then your vacancy goes, goes way down. And then there's actual vacancy um, and then the last one is non-revenue units, like if they convert one unit to storage or something like that. Mm -hmm. So all of those add up to economic vacancy. And I like to see that economic vacancy at about 8%. Mm -hmm. If it's much lower than that, then that's one of the questions I ask. Why is economic vacancy so low? If it's below 5%, then I'm having a hard time believing it. Unless it's in some place like Boise, Idaho, where someone told me there was like three vacant apartments in the whole town. Yeah. So those vacancy numbers I would believe, but you always have to put everything in context. So economic vacancy uh, includes that 5% of regular vacancy that absolutely. you would typically budget for. Yes, absolutely. Okay. It's, it's all of those. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And so another uh, metric I like to look at is property taxes. So usually when someone buys a property, the county reevaluates the taxes based on the new price that you bought it at, mm -hmm. right? So taxes should be higher and so what I look at in the pro forma, which is a prediction of what the tax burden will be, is I want to make sure that the current taxes are lower than what they're projecting in the future mm -hmm. because you're expecting the taxes to go up. So I just like to make sure, you know, that's another place where a syndicator could kind of fudge the numbers to make it look, make the returns look better. But in the end, they won't be better. Uh, is there anything else with regards to the metrics? You know, I think everybody needs to find their four or five favorite metrics or, or what they really want to look at and, and concentrate on those. One of the things, and I, I mentioned this, but I think it's worth repeating, is that part of the process of evaluating the deal is the continuation of the evaluation of the sponsor. And so I really use the deal information, the deal metrics to do a double check on the sponsor. Do they understand the deal? Do they know what they're doing? Are they going to communicate with me? And you know, are they are they going to be responsive? I think those are super important things because there's nothing more frustrating than sending someone fifty thousand dollars and not hearing from them again. Oh yeah, yeah. You need a sponsor analyzer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sweet. Well, that concludes chapter seven. We're now headed to chapter eight. Welcome back to the master class. We are now on chapter eight. 
what to expect before, during, and after investing in a syndication. From what I gather, passive investing doesn't seem so passive uh, after all we've talked about. Um, we've gone over how to pick a sponsor, an asset class, a market, and a deal. But can you kind of put a bow on this and put it all together uh, for us? Can you talk me through the process of investing in a syndication? Sure. So you're right. It, it doesn't seem passive because it is very active at the beginning when we're doing all those things you just mentioned, right? Screening the sponsor, the deal, the market, the asset class. It's afterwards that becomes more passive after you've made the investment. And also, once you get more experienced and you ha build a relationship with a syndicator, it's going to be even more passive because you'll know the deals that they're going to send you and you'll spend even less and less time on each deal. So it it is active in the beginning, but it becomes less and less as you as you move forward. Okay, so let's break it down step by step um, for our viewers who have been watching. What's the first thing we need to do? What do we want to do before we actually invest in this syndication? Okay, I, I like I like breaking it down this way. So first, you want to find a sponsor, and again, Left Field Investors, we have a sponsor overview, which is kind of small summaries of a bunch of different sponsors. We also have the um, sponsor screener which helps ask you questions so again if you're using your community this is helpful so first is find a sponsor and to do that you need to interview a sponsor review that sponsor's past deals and you can use our deal analyzer to do that and, and I, I recommend people looking at past deals and ask the sponsor hey can you send me your last deal so you can kind of get a feeling for it when the actual deal comes in mm -hmm. and then when they send you a current deal you're going to want to analyze that deal using whatever tools you have then you're going to make your investment decision and you're going to say, yep, I'm going to do it. And if you're going to do it, you submit what they call a reserve. Now there's hard reserves and soft reserves. Soft reserves are ones that you can back out of. You can say, yep, I'm going to invest $50,000 in this because sometimes you have to invest before you have full information. You have to commit because there's so much capital on the sidelines waiting to invest. Mm -hmm. So that's a soft reserve you can back out if you want. Then there's hard reserves, which is if you back out, that syndicator will not likely ever let you into a deal again. Wow. So a hard reserve, you need to know you're making a hard reserve. And you can ask them, hey, is this a, can, I, can I submit a soft reserve or is this, is this more committed than that? And then at that, in that process, you may also have to show that you're accredited if it's a deal that requires you to be accredited. And for that, they either have you fill out a form, like there's websites that'll prove that you're accredited, or if you have an accountant, they'll off, often um, write a letter that says, yes, he's accredited. Okay, so that takes care of um, everything we need to know before the actual syndication, but now uh, we've sent that reserve. What are we doing now during the syndication? So you're still kind of in the before, but you've made the decision. So the during to me is this is when you are signing the subscription document. So you, 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 you've already committed, so now they're going to send you all the documents you need to sign. Yeah. So you're going to review and sign the subscription document. You're going to sign the PPM, the private placement memorandum. You're gonna review the operating agreement, make sure that's all good to go. You're gonna get the wire instructions. Now this doesn't seem like it's a, a big step, but for me, what I've learned is, you wanna get those wire instructions securely. Because a lot of the syndicators will just send it in an email. And there's been a lot of wire fraud. Absolutely. And so what I do is I either get the instructions and call and verify them, or what I usually do is I ask the syndicator to send it in a DocuSign or some other kind of secure document so that I, I never wire money just that I got the instructions on email without verifying it. So that's very important. A lot of syndicators are now, they have portals on the internet where mm -hmm. you can like go in and see the investments and they'll just post them there. Mm -hmm. So make sure it's, you're sending it securely, then you send the wire and that's kind of the, that's kind of the during. Now you're just done. Yeah, you want to double, quadruple, triple check that one. Right, and part of that triple check, thank you for saying that, is once you send the wire, confirm that they got it. Mm -hmm. right? I always send an email to the sponsor saying, just sent the wire, let me know when you get it. And then I follow up with them until they give me written confirmation that they've received the wire. I do the same thing on a smaller scale on Cash App. I'll send a dollar first just to make yeah. sure they get the dollar. Yeah. yeah. All right, so what is the process like after that? So after is now, we're, we're saying after you made the decision to invest and you've sent the wire. So yeah. now we're talking about during the investment, right? Yeah. Now the investment's just going on. So what you need to do is save all the documents. And th this is kind of tedious, but if you don't do it now, you're, you're going to regret it. So you save all the documents, right? The signed documents, the PPM, subscription agreement, the offering memorandum where they're giving you all the details. You save all of that stuff, either paper files or you can save it electronically. 
um, then you enter the deal in whatever kind of tracking system you have. Now this has been a real problem for people is there, there aren't any official ways to track this. And what you want to track is you want to track your distributions, make sure they're coming. You want to compare those to the pro forma, what they said they would send you. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you only have one or two deals, Excel or something like that is fine. Um, but it gets complicated when you have 20 or 30 deals and you're tracking all this stuff. So at Left Field Investors, we've developed a um, portfolio tracker. And it's an online web tool where you can put all your deals and it'll help track stuff. So that, that's what I use. Um, and the things you want to track are the date you invested, the amount you invested, the name, obviously, then the sponsor's name and the entity that owns it, because those are going to be different, how you invested. Did you invest personally? Did you invest your own LLC? Did you invest through your tribe best tribe or a trust? Um, and then some of the financial assumptions from the pro forma, the expected annual cash flow, the IRR, which is internal rate of return for the life of the deal. I'll talk about that in a second. And then if there's re refinances expected when those come in. And then you're going to track your distributions, compare them to expected, and then you're going to track your K-1s. What was that IRR you were talking about? Okay, so IRR, it, it's really complicated to calculate. But basically what it is, is it's just using the time value of money, saying that if I receive $50,000 today from my investment, that's much better than $50,000 that I receive five years from now. So all it does is it brings everything into the, into the present tense as far as money. So it, it allows you to compare two different deals mm -hmm. that have um, incomes at different times mm -hmm. and compare them as far as what the returns are. Oh, okay. Then you'll be able to maybe also calculate if you're missing out on opportunity costs by investing in something quicker that you'll receive your money back quicker for now. Exactly. And you always want to, it's a great point because you always want to receive your money faster and pay your taxes slower. Mm -hmm. And so if you can figure out how to do both of those, that's how you're really making money. Nice. That concludes chapter eight. <sighs> On to the next chapter. Welcome back to the master class. You made it to the final chapter, chapter nine and my favorite chapter. Uh, how to invest with a tribe. Jim, you're a part of five tribes and you're a mentor of three. Why are you so attracted to tribe investing? I, I love creating and working with the community. And, and that, that's, that's part of it. It's the reason I started Left Field Investors was to learn, network, and grow with other people who are interested in this too. And part of it is these type of investments have not been accessible to everybody. Yeah. And part of my passion is sharing that anyone can do this. You can do this if you want to do this. And the easiest way to do it is with tribes. Because let's be honest, most people don't have 50 grand that they can invest at one time and regularly to get that diversification, mm -hmm. right? If you're investing 50 grand, it's gonna take a long, long time to save that up. And tribes solve that problem. Group investing solves that problem. You can get into many more deals, you can have the diversification, you can get into real estate, and you can learn and grow with others. And that's building a community, and that's what I'm passionate about. Mm. Five tribes, are they all investing in like the same thing, or can you kind of tell me a little more about them? Yeah, so they're all very different, and they're all established for very different reasons. So, so I'll go through them so you can understand maybe how tribes work a little bit. Yeah. So the first tribe I was in was, it was a couple of my former financial advising clients who, they're highly paid professionals, and they want to be in real estate, but they don't have the time, and they don't have the desire to learn about it. And mm -hmm. they knew I was doing this passive investing, and so we figured, hey, let's do it together and TribeVest made that super easy. So for those guys, I find deals, I will call or text them and say, hey, do you guys have any capital? If they do, then they'll say, okay, let's do it. If they don't, then, then we'll wait for the next deal. So they don't get involved in the deals at all other than knowing maybe the asset class. Mm -hmm. And they're just relying on me to, to do that work for them. And the reason why it's fine with me doing that, I'm fine with that is because I'm doing this investing anyway but partnering with them, we can get into more deals and we have the whole diversification thing. So this is a very passive, they're very passive and I'm just finding the investments for them. Do they, are they supply the money and you supply the expertise? We contribute equally, mm. but I, um, so we, we split it 33, 33, 34. So mm. I get, of the proceeds, I'll get an extra percent for the legwork that I'm doing. Got it, got and it. So some of the tribes are set up that way. Like there's another one of my tribes, my second tribe, which, um, somebody else manages, uh, uh, another one of the founders of Left Field Investors manages, but this one, so I remember I told you about the syndicator that we really liked that was getting me um, a lot of passive loss mm -hmm. with a bonus depreciation. 
Well, they come out with a deal every month at least, even maybe even more, and their minimum is $25,000, and they have great historical returns. So you, you can't be in every one of those deals, right? Because if there's 12 deals a year at 25 grand, that's just too much. Mm -hmm. But how do you pick which one to be in? Because you don't know which one's going to be the, the rock star and which is going to be just av average, and for them, average is 30%. Return so it's a great average. Good. <laughs> yeah, so we decided, hey, let's team up. So me and this other founder and, and some of his family, we five of us got together and we said, we'll just invest in every deal. So now we put the minimums twenty five thousand. So every time they come out with a deal, we all chuck five thousand dollars into our Tribest account, invest in the deal, and off we go. And that one, the other guy is managing that tribe, and so he takes a little extra cut for doing all the paperwork and all the the processing and things like that. So th that's a totally different purpose. Mm -hmm. And that tribe's grown a little bit too because now we'll also get into other deals that we get interested in. Mm -hmm. But the, the one with that sponsor, those are automatic. We don't um, even talk about those. That's awesome, I love that. Tell me about some of the other tribes. So the, the third tribe I started was, this was for beginners. This is, I wouldn't have had to start this tribe if we had this masterclass, I could have just showed them the video. <laughs> um, but basically this is, a mishmash of people. There's 11 people. Some are neighbors. Some are, you know, I have a college friend in there. Some are former financial advising clients. These are people that um, they don't own any real estate other than their house. And they may never have gotten into real estate, but they, they heard what I was doing and they were interested. And so we started a group and we started contributing $100 a month. Right? You know the minimums are going to be $25,000, right? So 11 people. It took us a while and then we did a little lump sum. But it was during the pandemic when we did this, so we would do Zoom calls every couple of weeks where I would take a topic and I would explain, I'd explain syndication. I'd explain all the stuff we're doing here. And at the end, we found a sponsor, and it was non-accredited. This is what made me go find all these non-accredited people. We found a sponsor that we really like. The sponsor actually came to one of our Zoom calls and talked about how he operates and what he does. And then we invested in this apartment deal. And I mean, everyone's excited, right? It's people that, you know, they, they, they don't, necessarily have the means to put $25,000 in a syndication of their own, but now we're up to 150 bucks a month. It's year two. We're going to get to the second deal in August. And, you know, it's just growing their portfolios and it'll be a little extra boost to their wealth. And then they can either invest on their own, start their own tribes. It's just to, to grow it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a learning tribe and it's one of my favorite groups. Yeah. So the last two tribes are very similar. They're just made up of members from the left field uh, investors community, people who've heard us talking about TribeBest and are interested, and they just wanted to get a group together. And they're all people who already know a little bit about syndication, but some of these were their first investments in syndications. So this group is a learning group for sure, but they're learning more, not just from me, they're learning from the community, and they form these smaller communities together that are working together to increase their wealth. And that's, that's the goal, right? You wanna get in these communities where you can learn, learn together, and figure out how to do this syndication thing. And the whole goal is, you know, we're not all trying to become rich, but we're trying to become time independent, right? So you're not trading money for time or time mm -hmm. for money. You're, you're building wealth so that you can have these passive investments that you don't have to worry about. You know, if I go on vacation next week, I'm still gonna have money coming in. And that's what passive investing is all about. Out of all of your tribes, um, how many people are you investing with? Like how many, uh, people are part of each tribe. So I've, uh, there's a tribe that has three, a tribe that has five, tribe, two tribes that have 11, and another one I think has maybe 10. Yeah. Wow. So, and you can have any number. I think um, a, lot of the, a lot of the benefits of the tribe is the community talking together and, and everything. But once it gets much past 11, I think it's going to be hard to get anything done because coordinating schedules for calls and everything. But Honestly, the TribeVest website makes it really easy because there's messaging on there. There's all kinds of, and I think we'll talk about that in a minute. There's all kinds of stuff on there that even makes a large group easy to manage. Mm -hmm. So you have, you're involved in actively investing with over 30 people. Um, how do you find people to be in your tribe? Yeah, I, I, I never really counted the 30 people, but you're right. So they, they really just come together for whatever purpose it is, right? I talk about passive investing a lot because I'm passionate about it. And so you can start groups with friends or you can start groups with colleagues or whoever your network that you want to work with is or uh, some of these tribes i have people that i never met before and i met them through a couple uh tribe best people and heard of tribe best but not left field investors and they contacted me and and so you want to have 
some familiarity, right? I think Tribevest a lot talks about investing with family and friends, and mm -hmm. that's best. But there are some groups that I'm in where nobody knows anybody. They all know me because of my role at Left Field Investors. And so we've developed trust between me and you, right? So then an acquaintance of yours might then trust me. And that's, mm -hmm. you need to have kind of the trust working out so that you can feel comfortable investing with people because it's a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? And again, Tribevest helps with that because the money is secure, it's online. You know, Tribevest has all the, the procedures and policies that kind of help with that trust aspect as well. Once you've actually found a tribe, how do you know that everybody's a good fit for the group? It, this is a critical step, right? right? You want to make sure that the tribe is aligned. Everyone understands that this is a long-term investment. You know, I, I tell everybody there's nothing more illiquid than a tribe best tribe investing in syndications, right? These are long, and that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means understand that once you join this tribe, you know, you're dating now, but you're gonna be married once you sign that LLC. Mm -hmm. And that means it's gonna be difficult to get out of if, if you want to. So if everyone's aligned and understands, hey, we're investing for appreciation or we're investing for cash flow, then, you know, you, you kind of have everyone's understanding, right? So a good example for me is the first tribe that I told you about with three people in it, it had four. And uh, the fourth was my dad. Yeah. And um, it just wasn't a good fit for him, yeah. right? So we, we did all the tribe best stuff, and he was just having questions about things, and he wasn't really, he just, it wasn't the right fit for him. And so we bought him out, and that was fine. There was no hard feelings, but that, that's great, mm -hmm. right? And some of these left field investor tribes that we've started, we'll start out with a group, and we'll have a few Zoom meetings. Then everyone's talking, getting to know each other, and talking about the tribe, and we'll have people drop out all the time, yep. and it's great. And I tell the people to drop out, hey, no hard feelings, because this wasn't the right fit for whatever reason. Better get out now than later. Yeah. And then usually a couple more stragglers come in and we, you know, and then the group kind of coalesces. Before we, before we invest, we probably have three, four, five meetings and people get to know each other and there's emails and, and all that. So I think that's important. It, it's to find people that you know, like, and trust that you want to build a community with. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've been talking a lot about the Tribe Best community or the Left Field Investors community. But once you form a tribe, that's another small community, right? Mm -hmm. And so you need to make sure that you have people that you're gonna be compatible with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in real estate and in business, a lot of times people say, stay away from family, like don't rent to your family members, don't <laughs> yeah. don't purchase property with family, but this, this really does uh, spread the risk sometimes. Um, if you can go into it with the tribe vest mindset and everything is transparent, they can see everything, it's all laid out on the table makes it safer to invest with those people, uh, with your family and your friends. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, talking about that, like how the process works is just you, you go to the website. Now, when I first started the website, uh, you know, it's grown a lot and it's gotten a lot better. Mm. And now people ask me, hey, I need help um, setting up a tribe. And I say, no, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. Go, go do it. It's yeah. easy. And there's one of the guys um, in one of my groups, I send people to him now because mm. he just set up his tribe. It was super easy. I didn't help him at all. And so people are now saying, hey, can you help me go on Tribevest and start a tribe? I say, wow. no, call Alvin. He'll do it for you because yeah. he just did it and it takes three minutes. Yeah. You know, and, and there's, when, you, when you go online to set it up, <clears throat> Tribevest is going to help you set up your LLC because mm -hmm. right? you need to form a company so that you're all equal owners or however you want to set it up. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to set up voting rules because you want to make sure that if you're making an investment, everyone's on board. And so for my tribe of three, our rules are everyone has to agree 100% or we don't invest. My tribe of 11, we do seven people, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't want to drag people along who don't want to invest, but you also don't want one person to, to stop the show. Right. And so TribeVest helps with all of that. Um, and they set up a business bank account for you. And then they do the, um, the same page, right? So that you, you talk about alignment and investing with family members. You want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So everyone gets together and figures out, all right, what's the process? What are we going to do? And everyone agrees to it. And that reduces some of the risk of investing with family or friends, I think. So can you kind of sum up the TribeVest online experience? TribeVest allows you to do everything from the website, from forming your LLC, funding, doing the banking, doing voting on, you know, are you going to invest in this or that, messaging, and you can store your documents as well. You can even send wire transfers from there. And it is secure. It's just like you're sending from the bank. Mm -hmm. So that concludes our master class. Thank you so much for staying tuned with us during the whole thing. I hope you learned something. I know I did. Again, my name is Julian McClurkin with Tribe Vest. I'm Jim Pfeiffer from Left Field Investors. Until next time, see you next Tribe.